I've been asked to talk about neonatal jaundice, aspects of it, uh, why are we still seeing conictoris in this country, and it's a kind of prelude to the evolution of some of the technology that Professor Bhutani and Ung are going to be telling us about later in can we be better at recognising certain forms of jaundice, particularly hemolytic jaundice? Um, I declare my interest, so I'm a consultant for these two American companies, Capnia you're hearing about today, and I thank them for hosting us today. Um, Vapotherm, the neonatologist amongst you will know, uh, nasal high flow therapy is my other passion in life. Um, what my clinical interest is, is in preventing conicterus. So where are we in this journey? Um, it seems quite a long time ago now, 2007, when Donald Manning published his survey of cases of severe hyperbilirubinemia. And these, this was collected over a two-year period in the United Kingdom and Ireland identifying babies who had serum bilirubin levels in excess of 510 micromoles per litre, or 30 milligrams per cent. And he found the incidence of that as being 7 in 100,000 babies. And of those babies, approximately 1 in 100,000 showed signs of acute bilirubin encephalopathy and developed the long-term sequelae that we know and call conicterus. So that was a sort of benchmark at that time. So in other words, it was a prelude to NICE. This was before NICE came out in 2010. Um, but what it was reminding us was a condition that should be a never event has never gone away. And I was asked to write a commentary in association with the publication of that paper. Um, and I titled that Preventing Conictrus, a Wake-Up Call. Uh, it is a woeful situation in that the UK there are no nationally agreed guidelines for the assessment and management of hyperbilirubinemia in the newborn period. Um, I, I know that I wrote that because I don't think I know anybody else who uses the word woeful and I, now, I get teased about that, it does sound a bit pompous. Um, but it's true, it was a complete mishmash up until that time. And it wasn't my commentary that galvanised NICE into developing a guideline. This was already occurring, and I think particularly on the back of Donald, Donald Manning's work. So what came along? The NICE Jaundice Guideline Group, uh, which met between 2008 and 2010. And uh, you'll see the, do, the nearest to me, this is Donald Manning, who did the survey. He's a, a paediatrician from Liverpool. He's now retired. A very, mo a very modest man, very quietly spoken man, who actually I think was a very important survey to have done. To my right is Janet Rennie. For those of you who don't know Janet Rennie, she, is the, uh, she was the chairman of the group, uh, a dynamo of, of energy in terms of uh, research and publishing and, and producing the Robertson and Rennie textbook. Uh, other members of the group, the lay members, midwives, health visitors, general practitioners. Um, those of you that have been on a NICE committee know what a sort of community it develops. So that was then, and this came out in um, May 2010, the full guideline. And what, I'm just going to convey a few of the messages from that. I know many of you working in the area, this, you'll be totally familiar with this. But we particularly said we should be identifying the at-risk baby, the baby who presents with jaundice in the first 24 hours, remains a neonatal emergency. And those babies should be reviewed by a paediatrician urgently to assess whether there are underlying diagnoses. And I'm sure we're going to be touching on these early onset jaundice babies, a good proportion of whom are, are hemolyzing. Uh, these, uh, these are the graphs that NICE decided to uh, incorporate into the guideline. Um, they've never had a name attached to them. Uh, Professor Bittani is famous enough to have a, a graph or a nomogram named after him. But uh, to acknowledge these, these were actually being developed at UCL in London. And they were developing these even before NICE came along. And we adopted them. So these guidelines for a single line for exchange transfusion and for phototherapy clear cut-offs were when you should initiate 
either of those treatments. Phototherapy, I don't need to remind you that about this, so uh, single light phototherapy and the monitoring that was advocated. And then what I preferred to call multiple phototherapy, but I'm now advised that the 2016 update committee thought that was a nonsense terminology. I like to refer to this as more intensive phototherapy, and I'll go along with that and I'll explain what I mean a bit later. But in, that, in those days, I meant using more than one piece of apparatus. So overhead lights, and often with a baby nesting on a fiber optic pad to give as much surface area exposure to light therapy. And that we restricted the sort of babies you can see on that list, particularly if the bilirubin was going up at a fast rate, particularly the baby where the bilirubin is always or almost encroaching on the exchange transfusion threshold, and also the baby that's not responding to conventional single phototherapy. So these were the, these, these were the graphs. And um, what I particularly liked about these graphs was, uh, and it still excites me to this day, if I go onto the website, and I don't know if they still do this, because I think you, probably, you can now print off the individual graphs. But to start with, you were able to just click on click on there and it would jump down and it always excites me. That's if, if you want to do adapt it for a 26 week gestation baby, I'm very easily pleased. Um, you drop it down. Now I presented some of this uh, uh, information when NICE came out. I went up to Manchester and gave a talk and there was some smart registrar at the back who put his hand up and he said, do you mean to tell me, Dr. Ives, that you've spent two years on a very expensive committee deciding to use the old rule of tens? So ten times the gestational age to give you the exchange transfusion cutoff, so 260 in this case, minus 100 to give you the phototherapy. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Uh, so this, this had been around for a while and we've just chosen, I don't know who came up with that rule of thumb, I can't find, I can see it in one or two neonatology handbooks going back 30 or more years, but I've never identified who came up with that rule of thumb. Um, it won't be Professor Batani because he uses different units. <laughs> oh, the other thing about these graphs, you notice when I clicked on that, the 26 was a minuscule little number in a little box there for 26 weeks gestation. I was sent this by someone uh, who I do know, I won't name them, but they were teasing me by saying, well, we've had a mistake on our unit because someone chose the wrong graph. They, they, they put the baby on a gestate, wrong gestation graph. So they're taking the mickey and said, I think you should design your graphs like this. You see, so if you're using it for a term baby, make sure it says it's for a term baby. The other thing I used to get shot down for was this area at the beginning of the graph with the upslope. And I seem to remember arguing for having a dotted line for the phototherapy intervention to start with to make people think. Because just because your junior takes a heel prick specimen, probably just to check the hematocrit on a newborn admission, they can't resist measuring the bilirubin. And you end up with babies on phototherapy with levels of 60, 70 or 80 micromoles per litre, where it actually doesn't work. Um, so that's been a bone of contention, that upslope. Uh, and, and the acknowledgement that the baby isn't in a toxic range at that point is just to promote preemptive treatment, particularly in the context of, of hemolysis. So that wasn't very popular when we first brought these guidelines in, particularly for the babies of 37 weeks gestation whom we'd made a distinction from the babies of 38 weeks and above. Right, so I'll give you an example of that. This is from my own unit. It's anonymized. Uh, you notice how I chose the color of our jaundice graphs appropriately. Um, so this is a little baby. I, my pointer is not, it doesn't work against this screen. But as you can see, a 33-week gestation baby, and it was noted that the bilirubin just crossed the phototherapy line to start with. Phototherapy was started, I can tell that because it's been blocked in at the top a little bit. The bilirubin comes under control, and then everybody thinks, oh, well, that's, that's the end of the story. Then we forget to measure the bilirubin for two days, and there it's up at exchange level. It should say, start light again. So we start the lights again and down it comes. 
So what are the lessons there? I think the baby probably didn't need the phototherapy in the first place. It then gave false reassurance that that was a problem in the past. Any premature baby still on a neonatal unit who's still jaundiced merits a daily estimation of their serum bilirubin. So we could have been caught out there if we hadn't measured it uh, at that time. Uh, a little bit of health economics uh, that was generated from the NICE guideline. I give this as an example. I, I, I make it really to state that around the time the guideline came out, the cost of actually implementing the guideline in terms of providing community midwives with transcutaneous bilirubinometers and providing the additional midwifery time would have been just over six million pounds. That equates pretty much to the single pa payment for a case of clinical negligence in conicterus. And if six or seven of those are happening a year anyway, you only need to prevent one or two to make the health economics work. Does the NHS pick up on this and say, right, we'll push money out so you can all have bilirubinometers? Of course not. For many years, people were scrambling around on charity money to get their transcutaneous bilirubinometers. I don't know now whether we've really got enough in the community. But that, that has been a move, and I think the vast majority of, of parts of this country do use transcutaneous bilirubinometry. So that's, um, that's, a bit, that's enough about NICE um, uh, for the moment, and I think Ung will update us on, on NICE 2016. Um, let's turn to the Americans and their experience. Uh, the American Association of Pediatrics Guideline for Phototherapy, interestingly, they stuck with additional risk factors. We decided not to, to some extent, thinking, well, more often than not, people ignore those risk factors. They obfuscate and say, well, the baby was only a little bit asphyxiated or um, there's a little bit of temperature instability or whatever. But I think this is an interesting list because it highlights sort of dual pathologies that might increase the risk of a baby developing conicterus. And I'll return to some of these. Obviously, the isoimmune hemolytic disease is an obvious example. And one of my particular interests at the moment is hypoalbuminemia. So if you've got a low albumin level, uh, you're more at risk of, of conicterus. So the Americans, instead of having single lines for uh, each gestation, have developed a, an amalgamated graph like this, and I don't know if you can see this from the back, but this is for babies um, of low risk above 38 weeks gestation, and that's pretty much the same as NICE. So on this side, 340 micromoles. If you're in milligrams per cent, it's on the other side. But then if you are, have risk factors, or if you're a well baby between 35 and 38 weeks gestation, the threshold is lowered, and if you've got the combination of being near term, 35 to 37 weeks gestation, and have risk factors, it's lower still, so down at 250. So that's a more cautious approach. I think it's an approach that makes people think a bit more. Nice, we decided to just be didactic, right? If that's the number, you've got one line to consider, no obfuscation. Um, we're going to see this graph many times. Uh, what's been developed in America is also attempts to predict which babies are going to develop significant jaundice. And there's been a lot of work from uh, Vinod Batani's group on, and quite rightly, it's known as the Batani, it's known as the Batani nomogram. But I like to call it the Batani graph because it allows me a little joke because this is the Batani laugh. <laughs> um, so uh, and we're going to see this in combination with assessing babies on the basis of their serum bilirubin level at the point that you discharge them from hospital or whilst they're in hospital in attempting to predict which babies are going to get more severe jaundice and require treatment. And what we're going to hear also is uh, the work that's being done combining that information with the end tidal carbon monoxide monitoring to detect hemolysis in that group quickly going through what I think are the reasons why certain babies uh, are more prone to jaundice than others. The low risk group, so if you're less likely to develop severe jaundice, it's often because genetically you may be a baby 
that doesn't break down your heme as fast as another baby. So if you've got a low heme oxygenase expression, you're not generating as much bilirubin. If you're not hemolyzing or if you're anemic to start with, you've not got such a pool of heme, you're less likely to get significant jaundice. And also, some people are faster excretors of, of, of bilirubin. So if you're term, you're feeding well, phototherapy will hasten that excretion as well. And if you're well and you don't have pathology, you should be at low risk of developing significant jaundice that requires treatment. The opposite, it can be said in terms of high heme oxygenase expression, if you're hemolyzing, if you're polycythemic, if you're a slower excretor, so prematurity conveys that slower excretion, hence babies 37, 36, 35 weeks gestation, they are at higher risk because they're slower excretors. Um, breastfeeding and jaundice is a, is a minefield. I could give a whole talk on breastfeeding and jaundice, um, but it, it is a fact that if you're exclusively breastfeeding, then you're more likely to have a more significant jaundice. Then a number of us, I think it's as many as one in 20 of us, a couple of us in this room have Gilbert's disease, where we are slow at, at conjugating and excreting bilirubin. So those are reasons why you might have very high risk. The other way of looking at risk is to say, right, let's look at the babies who sadly develop conicterus and look at their pathology, their diagnosis, their presentation. And a lot of work has been uh, done in this regard and very important learning messages have come out of a key registry uh, in the United States. For instance, over this period, which was published of a 12-year period, um, you have around 10 babies a year presenting. This is not the whole of the population of the states. These are the ones that are registered. Uh, but you can see a mixture of pathologies, many of which involve hemolysis, Interestingly though, about a third remain idiopathic. Is that because they've got inborn errors of metabolism we haven't yet determined? Many of them are late prematurity, this group that I am concerned about, where people treat 35 to 37 weeks as if they're term babies. And then these sort of risk factors that you all uh, recognize. And that last one was hypoalbuminemia. Uh, I show this because I think it's just a beautiful illustration of albumin binding a molecule of bilirubin and kind of making it safe. Uh, I'm a bit simplistic, but it's, it's homing down. You can see the bilirubin molecule up there here, but best represented here. Um, in fact, I'm not sure there are not two bilirubin molecules in there. Um, and it's almost like it's in the palm of a hand being sort of held. It's not free in the circulation. It's free bilirubin that is damaging its potential uh, to get across the blood-brain barrier and cause neurotoxicity. So if you've got a very low albumin level, you're not able to bind this bilirubin as safely, and you've got a higher level of free bilirubin. So bilirubin neurotoxicity, the acute toxicity we may see um, in babies who are ultimately going to develop the long-term features of conicterus are listed here. Um, and these are signs that should be recognized in babies. If a baby's jaundiced and they're showing any of these features, one needs to have certain alarm bells ringing. Changes in tone. Uh, the posturing. I didn't point out on that early slide of the, when I said it's a problem that hasn't gone away. The baby in the cartoon on the left was the baby with an arched back, and that's known as uh, opisotinous. I call it opisotinous. Uh, my, 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 my Oxford medical students might refer to it as opistotonous, but <laughs> opisotinous. Um, so back arching, hypertonia, um, is a feature, acute feature of, of bilirubin toxicity. And there may be seizures, irritability, apneas, which are probably seizures in themselves. But in term babies, up to 10% may be totally asymptomatic. Is that true, or is it we're just not picking up on subtle signs of bilirubin toxicity? In preterm babies, it's often said, and I think it's right, that many preterm babies 
you don't see any of these signs and symptoms because they're merging with their own condition. And you often don't, you don't tend to see the back arching, you don't necessarily see the seizures. So it's more the, baby, the preterm baby goes through its time in the neonatal unit, gets discharged home, and then presents later with a cerebral palsy that is characteristic of conicterus. These acute signs have been pulled together, uh, again, by um, uh, Lois Johnson and, and Vinod Batani's group in something called the bilirubin-induced neurologic dysfunction score. Now, I remember when this came out, I rather, I, I rather put a bit of scorn on this. I just thought it was generating another mnemonic for no good reason. But actually, this score, I think, has two great values. One is to encourage nurses and doctors to record in the notes the specific features that a baby who's severely jaundiced might be presenting with and see if there's a progression to the more severe forms. You see you score, it's a bit like an APGAR score, but you score zero to three in each of these, depending on whether you've got zero or advanced acute bitter even encephalopathy. Um, the other area where it's very important is in research studies, so that if you're looking at a population and seeing what relating serum bilirubin levels to the bind score and outcome, then you can see what different levels of bilirubin are implicated in conicterus, perhaps see what interventions are doing to that score. And also seeing whether if you get in quite early with your treatment, you can prevent progression to long-term pathology. So that's the scoring. So you notice the maximum score you could get was nine. Um, so if you're up at seven to nine, you've got advanced acute bilirubin encephalopathy, and there's a very high risk of injury, even if you intervene on those babies. Four to six, moderate acute bilirubin encephalopathy, risk of injury, but may be reversible. And then the ones to three, subtle signs of bilirubin encephalopathy, you should get away with with treatment. There's a little caveat there that if you are measuring auditory brain evoked responses for hearing, that if they're abnormal, it might put you up into a higher risk category. Interesting publications I remember from years ago, someone who demonstrated a baby who had abnormal auditory evoked responses from bilirubin toxicity was then monitored throughout an exchange blood transfusion and showed as you brought the serum bilirubin level down, created that gradient from brain to serum and had some elution of the bilirubin from the brain that the auditory evoked responses recovered. So again, it's, it's, it's reinforcing this point that just because the baby's got symptoms, uh, you don't say, well, that's inevitable, this baby's gonna have injury. You get in there, you redouble your efforts and treat as, as urgently as possible. The longer, ta longer term features of bilirubin encephalopathy, or chronic um, uh, conicterus as it's sometimes called, are listed here. The forms of cerebral palsy you're familiar with, the dystonic or chorioacetoid cerebral palsy. Um, auditory neuropathies, auditory dis dysynchrony. So th they may have some hearing, but it's also the processing of hearing that's important. Location of sounds, recognition of sounds, recognition of speech patterns, voice patterns. Uh, so the disability can be much more uh, than just a clear cut, can you hear or not? Um, you all know about the ocular motor paresis of upward gaze. Often these children have retained cognitive abilities and the frustration for them is being locked in a body that, that, is, that is very difficult for them to control and to be quite dysarthric with their speech. The dental enamel dysplasia is obviously not a neurotoxicity, but that's the sort of full house as, as, the, as the feature of conicterus uh, that you might see. I'm not, a, um, uh, I'm not an expert on neuroimaging. I'm just listing there and demonstrating the change in the globus pallidus, which is rather characteristic of bilirubin neurotoxicity and the other areas of the brain. But the MRI can be entirely normal in a baby and a child who develops the clinical signs of conicterus. So you can't just say, just because the MRI was normal, this child hasn't got conicterus. Um, so moving on a little bit to where we are in terms of thinking, is the baby with hemolysis at greater risk of developing this sort of neurotoxicity? Uh, and that's a kind of feeling, there's, there's not, a, 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 admit there's not a huge amount of evidence out there. There's consensus evidence from the American Academy of Pediatrics. There's a consensus amongst 
uh, neonatologists perhaps in this country who've seen these children with, with rhesus disease uh, being more prone to, to, to long-term injury. Uh, but th there is some information. So some of it comes from thinking about the causes of hemolysis. And these are common conditions in the newborn period and will present with jaundice in the first day or so of life. And some of it comes from, um, from papers. Now this paper uh, was um, a survey from a cohort of babies born, I'm almost going to say before I was born, but I, I'm sadly not, um, 1959 to 1966, so 54,000 babies. And they looked at these, and this is a, a the collaborative perinatal project in the States, 12 big US centers, uh, looking at these children at seven to eight years, looking at their IQ, their neurological examination, and doing hearing tests. Now, there, were, there was a bit of a fallout. They didn't capture them all, as you can see at the bottom there. But what did they see? They saw amongst that cohort, there were 56 babies who had a serum bilirubin greater than 25 milligrams per deciliter, or more than 425 micromoles per litre. And of those, 19, about a third of that group, had a positive direct agglutination test. And then when they looked at those babies, there was a significant difference in their IQ testing on the, on the vesicistic scale. Perhaps a bit tantalizingly, there was no difference in neurological exam and no difference in the audiology. So that's kind of circumstantial evidence. Another paper uh, looking at children uh, with severe hyperbilirubinemia in, in Egypt. This is a group um, in Egypt, also with uh, Richard Wenberg uh, from the States involved. Uh, so Cairo readmissions in the year 2008, and this, this is a bit staggering in itself, um, 200, nearly 250 infants with a bilirubin greater than 425, the range up to 1,300 micromoles per litre. I, I can't believe I've ever seen a baby with a bit of that high. I've seen one reported in this country of 1,000. Um, bind scores were done for the babies on admission, and 14% of this cohort had conicterus or death at discharge. And they were really looking at what were the comorbidities, what put babies in a higher risk group. If you had rhesus incompatibility, if you had ABO incompatibility, sepsis or if you were of low birth weight. Now the low birth weight may have just been a surrogate for low gestation. It's not detailed enough to have picked that out. So risk factors for neurotoxicity from this study group. Without risk factors, 111 of the 250, you didn't see acute bilirubin encephalopathy if the total serum bilirubin was below 540. And it was rare to see any long-term morbidity in that group. The distinction in the group below, where there were the risk factors, that with rhesus incompatibility and sepsis particularly, you had an increased risk of acute bilirubin encephalopathy and at a lower total serum bilirubin level. It didn't come out statistically significant for ABO incompatibility. So without risk factors, neurotoxicity was first observed at levels of around 540 with the risk factors that threshold came down to 25 which is 400, 425 micromoles per litre. So again rather circumstantial evidence uh, for this increased risk of neurotoxicity if you're hemolyzing. What, why should there be an increased risk if you're hemolyzing? Uh, people have put th forward various hypotheses. Is it the more rapid increment in the, in the rise in the, in the total serum bilirubin at perhaps an earlier stage in life? Is it because the duration of hyperbilirubinemia in these children is longer? Is it because they've got, in association, lower serum album, albumin levels? Or is something else to do with hemolysis affecting the properties of binding of bilirubin to albumin? Is there an altered susceptibility to neurotoxicity in these children? Are their blood-brain barriers the same if they're sick uh, uh, with, with, with hemolytic disease. And then a tag on at the end might be picked up uh, by uh, Professor Batani. I mean, is there any, any influence of carbon monoxide which is produced as you catabolize heme 
we know about nitric oxide as neurotransmitter, carbon monoxide has neurotransmitter uh, um, properties. So it, it, is this influential as well? We don't know. Can we influence hemolysis? Um, yes, if we identify hemolysis in certain, a certain context with isoimmunization and the presence of antibodies, then giving intravenous immunoglobulin can reduce the total serum bilirubin load and can prevent the need to do an exchange transfusion. So the examples I've given you there, the studies show that in rhesus hemolytic disease with effective phototherapy and giving intravenous immunoglobulin, the numbers needed to treat to prevent a single exchange transfusion is just two, so that's very effective therapy. The papers on ABO inc incompatibility would suggest that that numbers needed to treat is around five. Um, what these immunoglobulins do, they reduce the duration of the phototherapy, they may reduce hospital stay, but you need to be aware that the ongoing hemolytic process, although it's been subdued by immunoglobulin, may progress to present with late onset anemia. So these babies sometimes have to come back into hospital for a top-up transfusion. So that's some of the immunoglobulin story. Uh, the Americans' guidance, I don't know if it's changed since 2004, uh, suggests using IVIG uh, if the bilirubin is rising despite intensive phototherapy uh, or within 50 of the exchange transfusion line. Uh, the dose is given there and repeating doses every 12 hours. And if you have to intervene with an exchange transfusion, repeating the dose after the exchange transfusion because you'll have eluted out quite a lot of that immunoglo immunoglobulin during the exchange. Uh, UK NICE guideline, um, there is concern about exposure, exposure to, to babies, babies of, from immunoglobulin. And so we tend to, uh, and you see the cost side of things comes into that debate a little bit, uh, we tend to use it in babies as an adjunct to multi um, intensive phototherapy, sorry, um, uh, in rhesus disease and ABO incompatibility, and if the serum bilirubin is going up at more than 8.5 micromoles per litre per hour. And those of you that have used it, I'm sure you, you'll um, witness the fact it can be very effective and avoid transfusion. Principles in preventing conictrous, I'm coming to the end now. What the message was from, from NICE, don't guess the bilirubin level. You know, we'd had a whole era, and I'll, when I talk about the legal aspects of conictrous, I'll emphasize this later on. We don't guess the serum bilirubin level of babies anymore. We measure it. Um, we need to be much more alert to jaundice in babies with darker skin tone. These form a disproportionate proportion of the number of babies in registries of conictrous. It's because of late diagnosis with people not r recognizing jaundice. Um, I didn't touch on this before, but you're probably aware that we now use the total serum bilirubin as our threshold for treatment. We don't subtract the conjugated element and use unconjugated bilirubin as the, the guide for treatment. We need to optimize phototherapy. Uh, we need to consider hypoalbuminemia as, as a risk in itself and don't delay if an exchange is necessary. The other thing we should take heed of is the experience of the families affected by this condition. And those of you who haven't already visited this website for PIC, the parents of infants and children with conictrous, I strongly recommend you do so. One, just to see how these lives have changed. Also to be um, encouraged by how positive the parents have been and how heroic some, some of the children have been. Now I'm going to attempt to show a video which the sound is going to be quiet. We tried this earlier on. This is a little young boy called Jesse who's going to give you two messages to finish off my talk. He says, in two words, prevent this. In two words, prevent this. 